Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Nairi Woods, and I'm Dean of the Blavatnik School of Government at, at, here at Oxford University, and a huge warm welcome to all of you for this very special final instalment of this year's Kyoto Prizes at Oxford. The Kyoto Prizes were founded in 1984 by Dr. Kazuo Inamori. We're very honored to have his daughter, Mrs. Inamori Kanazawa, here with us this evening, who is now chair of the foundation, with whom we have a partnership to host these Kyoto Prizes at Oxford each year. The last two days, we've had the incredible pleasure of hearing Professor Brian Grenfeld, who's here, famous epidemiologist, and Professor Carver Mead, a technologist, um, who sadly couldn't travel, but we gave a wonderful uh, lecture online. Um, the Blavatnik School of Government hosts the Kyoto Prizes partly as a celebration of all that can be achieved in, in countries that are well governed. And the mission of the school is to help support and drive better government all over the world. So thank you for coming to celebrate this, this final event with us. At the end of the musical part of tonight's event, you're very welcome to join all of you to join us for a reception in Wadham College. You won't need to leave this property, you're just going to go out the door and, and round and we'll remind you at the end. But let me now turn to my Oxford colleague, Dr. Alice Barron from the Department of Music. Alice runs the South Asian Music Program in Oxford's Music Department. And Alice, it's such a pleasure to have you here to introduce our wonderful third Kyoto Prize Laureate of 2022, Alice. Thank you so much and welcome everybody. It is my absolute greatest pleasure and joy to be introducing the phenomenal musician and Kyoto laureate, Zakir Hussein. Zakir Hussein is a world-leading tabla player from the Hindustani North Indian classical music tradition. He began studying the tabla from a very young age with his father, Ustad Alaraka, who was a legendary tabla player known for his performances with Ravi Shankar. At the age of seven, Zakir began to play concerts, and by only 12, he had started touring. Zakir made his American debut performing with Ravi Shankar at the Fillmore East in New York City, and this is where he met the guitarist, John McLaughlin. Their friendship led to the formation of Shakti, a wonderful and groundbreaking musical group that also included the violinist El Shankar. Over the years, Zakir has accompanied some of the greatest Indian musicians and pioneered intercultural collaborations with a very impressive array of performers, including Van Morrison, George Harrison, Bella Fleck, Herbie Hancock, and Earth, Wind and Fire, to name just a few. His 1992 album with drummer Mickey Hart from Grateful Dead won him a Grammy Award and he's starred in the soundtracks of numerous films, both as a performer and a, as a composer. Zakir's unique talent and contribution to music has been recognized by many prestigious awards, including the National Endowment for the Arts National Heritage Fellowship, which is the highest award given to traditional artists and musicians in the US. Zakir's extraordinary contribution to the arts can be seen in the elevated status of his instrument, both in India and globally, bringing the tabla into a new dimension of appreciation. Today, Zakir Hussain will be joined by Kirpal Singh Panisar, playing the Esraj, which is a very beautiful stringed instrument. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Kyoto laureate Zakir Hussain. Shawl. 
May I ask you to join me in welcoming Mr. Kripal Panisar. He is going to uh, uh, provide me some support with his instrument, Israj, which is a bowed instrument and uh, represents the melodic element of the repertoire that I am going to share with you. So thank you all for being here. Thank you to Kyoto Prize for making this possible. Thank you to Oxford for providing us this incredible hospitality and such generous love and affection. Nari and everybody else. So, ta-da. Oh, I thought you were going to join me. <laughs> Tabla is the language that I speak through. It's uh, been with me, I guess, since I was born. And uh, literally, when I was two days old and I was brought home from the nursing home where I was born. My father, who was a great tabla player, took me in his arms and started singing rhythms in my ear. And that was a routine he followed for many, many moons where he would just hold me and for hours at a stretch, just sing rhythms in my ear. And uh, kept pouring in that information. And uh, until I think I was about three years old, and then he let me go. And uh, started concentrating on other students and teaching them, and no attention to me. And I think the whole idea was that he had put all this information inside of me and I was supposed to figure out my own way to be able to tell the story. Whatever that story would be, would be the way I would speak it. And that is at the core of the tradition I represent. We learn the music but we don't present it verbatim as written or as taught, but we try to absorb it and organize it in a way that it appears to be each of our stories individually spoken, but collectively understood. So the word that people usually use for that kind of stuff is improvising. So you take the music that you've been taught and as you sit on the stage, you in a spontaneous manner speak it as the inspiration comes to you. So it's always fresh, it's always different, but yet the root is always the same. And uh, so I learned from my father, Ustad al and uh, but I don't play like him. I do not address the instrument the way he did. And uh, Neither do my brothers, who've also studied with him. 
we each speak the language in our own way. We have developed our own vocabulary. This, what we call pratha or tradition, has been in practice in Indian tradition for over a thousand years. The music that is played on this instrument and on this instrument has existed in India in this very form that we have now for almost 2,000 years. <clears throat> but tabla is only about 250 odd years old. So it's one of the younger entries into the North Indian classical music. The repertoire that the tabla represents is, however, almost 2,000 years old. And tabla came into this system out of necessity. There were many other instruments that were invented three, four, five hundred years ago. You know those instruments like the sitar or the sarud, uh, sarangi. And these instruments and a particular vocal style known as khayal became prominent forms. These instruments required a different kind of a rhythmic accompaniment. And so the need to invent a rhythm instrument uh, led to inventing this instrument, tabla. What's interesting is tabla is a common word that is used in the Arab world for drums. So I have no idea why this particular instrument was called tabla, uh, but tabla is a common name for drums in, in the Arab world or the Middle East. It is a two-piece drum, as you see. It is tuned with a hammer. The small drum is the drum that is pitched or tuned to the tonic note of the melodic instrument. The bass drum is not tuned normally, but you can get different notes out of it. So you can get those, the, the scale out of it. Later on, I will take uh, requests. <laughs> <coughs> so it's possible to play melodic tones out of this instrument. What's interesting is that when the instrument was first brought onto the stage, it did not have this ability. This is a more newer uh, invention. In the old days, we played tabla sort of in this manner. Now, with the in, uh, support of the sound system, where you are able to play easy and subtle, but uh, also have the tones enhanced, you find 
different ways to be able to melodically support what you're doing. So. So you can, uh, so now the, t the tabla is much more of a muscular tradition. In the olden days, like that, but now, So it's much more subtle than it used to be before. It, and, and this is a newer technical uh, addition to the, in, to the performance of this instrument. And uh, that's made it possible for us to be able to not only uh, provide rhythmic support to a melodic instrument, but also harmonically support by playing dominant or subdominant notes of a scale. That is, being, that is being performed by the melodic instrument. So, uh, one of the things that I have to do is show you how this is tuned. It's tuned to D right now. Normally we tune to an instrument called Tanpura, which is a drone instrument, but we've gone even more ancient now. And we use uh, a drone instrument called uh, the iPhone. <laughs> which is right there. <laughs> it has an app which plays the Indian Tanpura. So you can tune and uh, check your text messages at the same time. So there is an interesting tonal thing that happens with the tabla. This is the main note, but it has shades. All on this one finger, many different shades. So even though it's a simple drum, it has many possibilities in being able to use the same tone but change it ever so slightly. So if I want to go. So you can have many different tonal uh, uh, changes to the same phrase, right? Uh, like, uh,
So you're placing the accents and the tonal changes in the same phrase, so you appear to be improvising or doing different phrases, but in reality, you're just fooling the audience by doing the same thing and, and uh, just placing it in such a way that it sounds different. Having said that, the repertoire of this particular instrument is quite vast. There are rhythm cycles that are played as short as four beats, as long as 108 beats. So four, five, six, seven, eight, nine onwards, all the way to 108. So you have 104 different rhythm cycles already at that point. Then there are half beat rhythm cycles, like six and a half, seven and a half, eight and a half, and so on. And the total number of rhythm cycles then is about 360. So I know about maybe 14 or 15 of them at the most. It's taken a very long time to try to be comfortable in about 14 or 15 rhythm cycles. It's, and the reason for that is you can learn the repertoire in each rhythm cycle, but to be able to make it your own and present it in a spontaneously improvised manner, for that you need to be so comfortable with it that uh, it has to be second nature to you. So for that to happen and that DNA to sit inside of you, it takes a long time. It's almost like learning a, a long Mahler piece by heart and being able to play it with the orchestra. It's difficult to do that. So, <coughs> excuse me. The most common rhythm cycle that we play is a cycle known as teen tal. Teen tal is a 16 beat rhythm cycle. Uh, basically four groups of four beats each. And a lot of the repertoire that has been developed in recent times for tabla is in that particular rhythm cycle. Now tabla alone cannot just play the rhythms and uh, there is no way for the audience to mark the rhythm cycle if the tabla plays alone. So a melodic instrument has to uh, provide what we call lehera, which is a melodic bass line that repeats constantly and, and lays down the rhythm cycle in the melodic form for the audiences to follow. <coughs> the melody or the lehera that is played is played in a prescribed raga or a mode. The one that has been chosen by Kripalji here is a raga known as Jana Sammohini. It's a tongue twister for many, but Jana Sammohini, easy for us, but it's not that easy to uh, pronounce. And um, it's a more kind of a recent uh, addition to the raga repertoire of North Indian music. Um, uh, only in the last hundred odd years or so, this rag Jana Samohini became a more popular and accepted raga for classical music. I'd like Kripalji to be giving you the basic scale of that raga, ascending and descending notes first. Now, the basic scale, which is the Bilawal scale, is simple. Uh, 
which is common everywhere in the world. So this differs from the Janasam Mohini that he just played. So that, that is a difference. Then comes what we call the dominant and the subdominant notes in a scale. And in this particular raga, it is the tonic note and the fifth. That's the tonic note. The tabla is tuned to that. And that's... So the dominant note is sa, and subdominant note is pa which is the fifth. And there is another thing that the audiences are able to tell which raga is being performed because, uh, by the musician uh, presenting what we call the pakad or the face of a raga. In other words, there are particular phrases that are placed in the order in an order in the scale which identify what that raga is and those phrases are so that is a, a a common uh, riff that is played, and, and when you play that, you know that that raga is Janus Hamohini. Uh, so when the musician is improvising, he will make sure that whatever the spontaneous improv is, that it eventually brings into play the pakad or the face of the raga. So that sets up the raga and, 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 and sets the mood for, uh, you know, by pre pre presenting the pakar of the raga and mood of the raga is brought forth. Now comes the lehra, the melodic bass line that is played over and over again continuously uh, for the tabla player to play on top of it. Now in this case, it is 16 beat rhythm cycle and the melodic bass line or the lehra as it is called is the downbeat or the first beat is always the tonic that note three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve 13, 14, 15, 16, 1. So always the 1 is that note, which is D in this case, Sa. So um, whenever I play, I, have, I will improvise. And um, when I want to finish, I have to make sure that I finish on the first beat of the rhythm cycle, 15, 16, one, always there. Right now it's not in tune. <laughs> so keep this in mind. Now I just want to give you a little 
a demonstration of the language of tabla. So if I'm going to speak to a tabla player, and I would say the bhari part of a, a, of a composition or a kaida, the tabla player, the other one, should be able to sing back to me the khali part. So if I was to tell Nihal ji, so there it goes. So this is a language we speak. So the communication is already established. So this is uh, the language that we speak and uh, we put expression into it. So dha is a first note of the tabla and it involves the bass drum and the high pitch drum, dha. Tete. Kat. Ghe. Dhage tete. Tere kite. Kite takatun. So as you say, the sounds emerge. Trikita kata ghenta dha. Dha trikita kata. Dha trikita kata trikita kata kata. Ghenta kata trikita kata 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 trikita dha. Trikita kata ghenta dha. Dha trikita kata. Dha trikita kata trikita kata trikita kata. Dati da kate na gena. Tati da kate na gena. So, this is just me improvising and, and uh, not uh, fixing anything, but just going with it. And what's interesting is that when my brain thinks of a phrase, the instant transmission to the to the hand happens and 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 that can only be accomplished in a process which is what we call in indian music the oral tradition when we learn music it's always singing back and forth i remember when i was 7 years old my father would take me to a shrine which was just down the road from where we lived at three o'clock in the morning. And we would sit in front of the door of the shrine and he would sing rhythms to me and I had to sing rhythms back to him. And that was the way we le I learned. And I never wrote anything down. Till today, it's a little difficult for me to write things down because I haven't figured out really how to do that. I just learned and I recited and and uh, just speak the language. And when I teach the students who are studying, uh, they write things down now. They're very good at it. Uh, but uh, the original tradition was always to uh, just sing and learn and just absorb as much as you can in, in your brain so that it stays with you all the time. You don't have to consult a book or a page or a, you know, a recording of any kind. So that's the thing. So a little bit of the lehra, and then I will play a little something for you. And there are three or four different things that are very important when it comes to presenting Indian uh, rhythm music. The first thing is peshkar. Peshkar is literally translated means to present your work. So the first movement of the tabla is peshkar. The second thing that the tabla does is presents what we call kaidas, uh, which are uh, uh, themes that are pre-composed. And those themes 
are then improvised upon on the stage. The third thing is a series of compositions which are fixed that have been handed down 150, 200 years old that you recite and then play on the instrument so that people can see how the language is, is printed and transmitted. And then the fourth thing is, is the climactic move, movement where you play relas, uh, fast moving rhythmic patterns. And uh, so these are four different elements that are presented. I will give you one example of each and hopefully that's all, that's all the time we will probably have before the Q&A. Here we go. One. Seven. Eight. Nine. Ten. Eleven. Twelve. Thirteen. Fourteen. Fifteen. Sixteen. I can sing. That's the first movement, which usually actually takes 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, and I just basically gave you an example. What it does is it introduces all the syllables and phrases that are going to be used in the rest of the performance. So that's what the Peshkar does. It's to present uh, what's to come next and then next. And now the Kaidas. In this form, it is up to the rhythm player to decide whether the tempo remains the same or moves up. So, since I'm the boss here today, I will change the tempo. Dhati dhage na dhati rikit dhati dhaga Thinna ke na tati ta ke na dhati rikit dhati dhaga Thinna ke na This is the theme. So on this theme, I will build using the same phrases that are in the theme. That is the rule. You cannot use any other syllables or any other uh, phrases. So Dhati dhage na dhati tikit dhati dhag Tinna ke na dhati dhage na Dhati tikit dhati dhag Tinna ke na tati ta ke na dhati tikit 
धाति धाग धिन नागे धाति धागे ना धाते रिकेट धाते रिकेट धाते रिकेट धाति धागे ना धाते रिकेट धाति धाग धिन नागे ताति ताके ना तिरिकेट ताति ताके ना ताते रिकेट ताके ना ती धागे ना तिरिकेट धाति धाग धिन नागे ना धाति धागे ना धा तिरिकेट धाति धागे धिन नागे Tati ta ke na tha tere ke te tati ta din na ke na. Tati da ke na da tere kri tati da ke din na ke na tati da ke na da tere kri tati da ke din na ke. Basically, the idea. Now, the kaida. This ka kaida theme and variations usually are the main part of the uh, of the repertoire, and could go on for half an hour, 45 minutes. Uh, so, this is just a simple idea given. Uh, then comes the compositions, which are recited, and which represent stories as well. Da din din na, da din din na. I am at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 30, 40, 50. This is a small composition, pre-composed, but it has a visual to it. So, expressive element comes into play. Like, if I wanted to ask a question in tabla, where were you? The answer might be, I was with friends. What did you do there? So, where were you? With some friends. What did you do there? A question. Nagadet te tegin taran ta? Vathe te kata, nothing. But there were So there was Bob and there was Carol and there was Ted and Helen. Kata ke gedin, nagadet te tegin taran ta? Te te kata kad. A deer moving around in the forest, looking for food. McDonald's is closed. Pizza Hut, not happening. And But looking for some more. Runs into a hunter. And then runs away very fast. But the way the deer runs, 
It's almost like a half flying, half galloping, very beautiful gait. So that is shown also in the syllable. This is an invitation to you all to come to a concert of mine. So, the invitation says, please come to the concert, sit down, relax, have something to eat, something to drink, then listen to the concert and go home. So, all that in these syllables. And then listen to the concert, get it a and then go home. Right? Representing the gate of a horse. Thank you very much. It is difficult to uh, compress a 90 minute to two hour performance in about, to about 12 to 15 minutes, but uh, here we are. Uh, so I think we will have Dr. Alice here set up for a little Q&A if we have time. We have Eight and a half minutes to do that in. Thank you. I forgot to mention that one of the important ingredients for the tabla solo is an age-old 
family concoction known as Johnson's baby powder, <laughs> but I suggest don't use it anymore. Uh, just a short, big thank you to Kripalji. <laughs> I only came from Boston over here, uh, but he had to come a long way, all the way from Birmingham, <laughs> which is where he resides, resides. Very fine player. So. Well, Thank you so much for that incredible lecture and your most kind. performance. And I, yeah, I wish we could hear more and yeah. look forward to when you're next playing in the UK. Um, so to begin with a question um, about your contribution and the tabla. Um, the tabla is predominantly an accompanying instrument, but you've been really responsible for changing that, both in intercultural collaborations and as a soloist. And I'm really interested in um, what the challenges have been with that and also what you see for the future. Uh, even now, the primary role of a tabla is to be an accompanying instrument. Uh, the repertoire that we've been using in tabla to present a solo concert is still being developed. Uh, because it only came into its own in the last 120, 130 years. So, uh, uh, and till recent time, the repertoire of the old instrument Bakhawaj was being transposed onto the tabla. In the last 60, 70 years, special compositions uh, have been developed for just the tabla and using the tabla technique uh, and so it's still coming into its own. So I am pretty sure that as far as the future of tabla is con concerned, there's a lot more to do, a lot more to develop. Uh, and um, uh, what, I s what I have to say about tabla becoming a solo instrument uh, is that I am not solely responsible for it. It's not my fault. Uh, there were three amazing tabla maestros who followed a fourth one who was before them, Ustad Emajan Thirakwa, who was considered the first tabla maestro to be universally accepted in India as a soloist. Then came the three incredible maestros, the trinity of tabla, we call them, Ustad Allah Rakha, my father, Pandit Kishan Maharaj, and Pandit Shamta Prasadji. These three <coughs> were so amazing on the stage, so magical, so electrifying in their performances, that they became instantly popular with the audiences. They formed partnerships with three amazing instrumentalists of that time, Pandit Ravi Shankar, Ustad Ali Akbar Khan, and Ustad Vilayat Khan, the three great instrumentalists. And these three tabla players, you know, at any given time, played with any one of those. And their combination was so amazing, so magical, so incredible, that the audiences started noticing that there is something special about tabla as an instrument and it should be focused upon. And so these three then became the soloists who were 
are often invited to festivals to present solo performances. So a platform was built by them uh, for little ones like me to come out and take advantage of. Uh, I got a chance because I got to play at a very young age with the same maestros who these three tabla players played with. And uh, uh, so a built-in platform ready to go. And uh, then something interesting happened to me and that is I became a, a seller. I started selling tea. Yeah, a tea called Taj tea. There's, I started selling on television. And, and so my face became well known, my name became well known, and uh, I was seen on billboards and everything, on the buses in India and so on and so forth. So because that happened, uh, I got started to, I started to get invitations to go and play solo concerts and, 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 and be presented in big concert halls uh, as a soloist. So everybody thinks that I sort of started this solo tradition, but it's not true. I just happened to be at a place where I was able to uh, just expand uh, the audiences in terms of number to bring the solo tablas in. But the future is very bright. Some of the tabla players playing now are amazing. I'm, I'm shocked when I see them, my jaw drops down there. No, really, they are very good. And, and, and so the future of tabla is assured. I'm not really the best tabla player in the world, by the way. I have to tell you this. I'm not the greatest. There are at least 10 or 12 other tabla players who are just as good as I am, if not better, on their days. And uh, so um, it's always that. I mean, uh, when Pandit Ravi Shankar was considered the face of in Indian classical music, the greatest well-known musician, there was another sitar player who was equally great, but did not get the kind of platform that Ravi Shankarji got. <coughs> Uh, uh, because he did not have a George Harrison for a student. <laughs> and that sitar player was Ustad Vilayat Khan, an amazing sitar player, uh, unparalleled in his ability to present music. So similarly, I may be the marquee name uh, because of my visibility, but there are at least 10 others who are just as good, if not better. Thank you. Um, we're going to come to questions in the room in just a second, but we've got one from our online audience. Mm -hmm. um, a tricky question. Which has been your favorite collaboration if you had to choose only one? A favorite what? Collaboration from your career. Favorite collaboration for my career? Oh, oh my God. <laughs> you know, that brings me to, I mean, today is uh, one year since Pandit Shiv Kumar Sharma, the Santur Maestro, passed away. And uh, I have to say some of the most memorable concerts that I ever had in terms of collaborating with another musician was with him. And uh, so it's uh, interesting that you asked me that question on this very day. Uh, collaborations worldwide is a, an interesting thing. I mean, I just am looking forward to playing with uh, John McLaughlin, who's an amazing guitar maestro. Uh, we have a group called Shakti that is starting a European tour in London's Hammersmith Odeon on June 27th, and it goes through Europe. So collaborating with him or collaborating with Shivji or with Hari Prasachi or Asiyaji and all. These are musicians who I have been playing with for the last 40 odd years. And uh, collaboration is not just meet somebody and perform. It, you have to connect on so many different levels. Uh, you get to know each other inside and out, the likes and dislikes and families know each other and it's, it's, it, you become a family, and when that happens, the music uh, is at a whole different level. And so 
I am lucky that I get to still play with musicians that I've been playing with for the last 45 years. And, and so uh, uh, those collaborations are great, but I recently am starting to get into uh, writing concertos for symphony orchestras. So I have done three, and I have a fourth one on the way that will premiere in September. So, uh, so those are interesting collaborations that I look forward to. Thank you. I'm sure many of us look forward to hearing those too. Um, we've got a microphone in the room. Would anyone like to ask a question? Thank you, that was fantastic. Um, I wondered if you've uh, been considering how artificial intelligence will change sort of the nature of the, you said it's an improvised art, um, and how it might change or improve the-, the Well, I mean, you know, it's an addition, isn't it? It's a continuation art intelligence, artificial intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know, it's a play on words, but uh, um, I guess, you can say that it might be possible to mechanically present uh, a particular art form which may be in its presentation flawless, but will it have human warmth? Will it have that spontaneity that you're looking for, that interaction that you're looking for when an audience responds to a certain phrase or a certain passage of music, uh, it elevates the experience to a whole different level because the musician is then able to react to that and up the ante instantly. Will that be possible with AI? I have no idea. And will people want to see, uh, I don't know, a screen or, I don't know how that's gonna happen, but, um, I guess in terms of having some help in being able to write music, to compose music, to analyze what's there, and, and to get it to a point where it is smoothed out enough to be able to then, for a musician to be able to present it, is a collaboration that a human being and AI can do. <coughs> Many hands. Yes. Ladies first. Thank you so much for this very touching and moving performance. Yeah, you're most kind. Thank you. Uh, and and I think so. Like um, my question is probably also related to the uh, theme today. Like I think Tokyo Toyoko Prize is awarded to. Um, people with um, making great contributions not only to one specific era but also like humanity and generally I can really sense the beauty of humanity from your performance because of a very rich um, um, history as well as set of universality of spontaneous expression of human emotions through a very unique way of storytelling um, but my question is probably about your perceptions about how this specific um, kind of music form with such a unique fun, um, tradition um, can contribute to the um, music development in general. Like what are the sort of unique contributions you will see? Um, because you're also collaborating with musicians from different genres and uh -huh. different traditions and uh -huh. also writing, uh -huh. um, like composer music. So I wonder, like, how would you see that this tradition, specific tradition, is connected with a greater um, music development? But in a way, that's where we are headed, isn't it? I mean, uh, the world is becoming smaller. The lens of creativity is getting broader and broader and broader. So uh, um, I feel that even to start with, there are no fences when it comes to creativity. There are no borders or walls that you need to climb in terms of creativity. I mean, that is why, it, uh, I mean, the origin of, origin of what I just did, the music, uh, it's, it's an interesting story. Uh, about 800 odd years ago, uh, uh, 
a great Sufi saint named Amir Khusro was in India and he represented Sufi music, uh, the Islamic form of music. But he was so taken by the music that was being played and performed and practiced in the temples of India uh, uh, in, in, in the praise of the Hindu gods. Uh, for him, it was an, a music of incredible beauty. And, and, and so all he could think of was somehow finding a way to pay homage to that. And he came, he put together both forms of music and created a third form of music, which is now known as North Indian classical music. It's, uh, it was put into place 800 odd years ago. Before that, the music was performed in the temples of India using veena and singing and pakhawaj, various instruments. And, uh, but the present form, which Pandit Ravi Shankar or Ustad Vilayat Khan Sahib or Bismillah Khan Sahib, the Shainal play, all these guys played, that's about 800 odd years ago. And, and it's a, a secular form of music. So this collaboration kind of stuff has been going on for ages. Whether, uh, uh, I mean, look at the gypsies who traveled all the way from the deserts of Rajasthan and Spain is where they ended up. And that whole form of music, that's why you find uh, uh, melodic scales in the Spanish form of music or in the Palmas uh, form, which are the same as the melodic scale in North Indian classical music. So that's an interesting thing. Celtic music, for instance. Uh, the Celtic musicians interacted with North Indian musicians when they were in the British Army, in the marching bands, way back in the northern, northern frontiers of India. And, and you find those Celtic forms now in Indian uh, procession bands they use the same instruments like the bagpipes and the whistles and uh, the bodrons and so on. And, and they perform this hybrid form of music which has shades of Celtic music and Indian folk music and so on and so forth. And that Celtic music found its way to, to the southern states in the United States and became bluegrass. And, and, and so, this kind of collaborative interaction has been taking place for centuries, not just now. And I just feel that uh, uh, these, uh, this coming together of musical ideas uh, have never known boundaries. Today, yesterday, thousand years ago, and will not know boundaries. What they do need is support. They need uh, willing hands and willing helpers to move them forward. And, 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 and that has happened over the time. In the times of Renaissance, it was the, the, the Italian kings and princesses who, who helped um, you know, people like uh, great composers like Mozart and so on to write music uh, and commission them and so on and so forth. Um, in these days, it's an amazing, remarkable uh, uh, work that is being done by the Inamori Foundation. The Kyoto Prize is one example of that. And, uh, and there are such, uh, you know, aware souls who are able to uh, uh, support remarkably diverse uh, researches, music, collaboration, art of all kinds. And, and, and so this is a wondrous time of, in, I think, on the planet uh, where music is becoming uh, a universal voice as opposed to Italian or Indian or Chinese or Japanese or, uh, or Afro-Cuban or something. It's, there is a collective uh, language that is being developed uh, uh, that uh, universally speaks of 
a unified statement of art form, and uh, and um, and this is a rem this is just amazing for me to watch and be a part of. Thank you. Um, I feel like that's a very poignant place to finish. Mm -hmm. um, about the, the power and beauty of music. I'm sorry we haven't got around all the questions, but please do join us for the reception at Wadham College. You're all very welcome. Just, um, you don't need to go out of the building, but just turn left out of the hall, and we can continue many of these conversations. Um, yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Alice. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you so much, Kirpal, for being with us today. And from all of us at Oxford University, we are incredibly grateful and privileged to have been with you, Zakaji, today. And um, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs>